Good evening, and welcome back to the Whalen Library. Thank you for being here. Uh, tonight, we are excited to have Whalen's own Evan Haddingham here to share his latest book, Discovering Us, 50 Great Discoveries in Human Origins, published in collaboration with the Leakey Foundation and available at your library and where, wherever books are sold. Evan Haddingham is the senior science editor of the PBS Nova series produced at GBH in Boston, where he's responsible for the editorial accuracy of the science content in the award-winning documentary series. Excuse me. Evan's love of archaeology. Okay, I'm going to mute the folks. <laughs> Sorry. Excuse me. Evan's love of archaeology began as a teenager. He went on to volunteer with rescue digs in Britain and France and to earn an MA in prehistory and archaeology from the University of Sheffield. His popular books on archaeology include Circles and Standing Stones, Secrets of the Ice Age, Early Man in the Cosmos, and Lines to the Mountain Gods. His feature articles have appeared in National Geographic, Smithsonian, The Atlantic, and Discover Magazine. Thank you again to Evan for being here with us tonight. Just a couple housekeeping notes. You can tell that we are trying to do this on Zoom and in person, so pardon the glitches. We're also recording this session for broadcast on Wakeham, our local cable access channel, and for the library's YouTube page, so you'll be able to watch and share with friends. Evan will speak for about how many minutes? Uh, I'm covering the whole of human evolution. <laughs> <laughs> How many thousands of years do I have? <laughs> <laughs> you have as long as you night, but we'll keep the questions till the end. Yeah, we'll try yes. that. Okay. So we'll keep questions to the end. And if for those of you who are joining us via Zoom, please feel free to put your questions in the chat at any time, and I will read them aloud at the right time. And now I'll get out of the way okay. and hand it over to Evan. Thank you. And I will reveal the true <laughs> self. <laughs> well, thank you all for uh, attending and tuning in tonight. Um, we're going to be delving back far into the past, but I thought I'd start with a bit of my own personal past. Um, in the summer of 1975, I was 24 years old, and I signed up for an excavation, an archaeological excavation in France, which, now this project was unpaid, but it had something better than money. They served a six-course uh, Cordon Bleu lunch every day, fully the full Julia Child treatment, followed by a one-hour siesta. So that was, uh, and this weekend I went searching for an image of this project online, and I was completely astounded to realize that I was in a corner of this picture. I'd never seen this picture before until this weekend. So this scrawny, half-naked guy is, is the 24-year-old me. And um, where I'm excavating is the collapsed roof of a cave where people in the Ice Age uh, lived for a period, total period, although we didn't know it at the, at the time I was digging, of more than 100,000 years. Uh, hunting groups would camp here periodically, not right inside the cave, but in the cave entrance, because that was the place where they could shelter but still get plenty of daylight. That was, this was their living space where they would build hearths and drop their tools and garbage and animal bones, so you build up a picture of the prehistoric life. But there was more to this cave than, than that. And um, uh, at one point, I visited the interior, the deep interior of the cave. Now this involved, it narrows to a little foxhole, and there's only room for you to go on hands and knees and that proceeded in this steep downhill, very claustrophobic tunnel for 60 feet. And then it opens out into a, uh, a hidden chamber, um, no more than the size of the Raytheon room here, and not exactly uh, a place you'd go visit for the beautiful stalactites, because in fact they would wallop you on the head if you stood up too suddenly. Um, but the special thing about it is that at the far end, there were these, um, hand impressions, and these were created by a person in prehistory holding their hand up against the rock, and they had pigment 
which is made out of uh, red ochre, hematite, is a very common substance, mixed with some kind of, of binder, I'm not sure what, maybe animal fat, and this would have been stuffed in a little hollow bird bone and blown against the wall. And these are very common, um, but there is kind of a, a new finding that uh, these go very far back in time indeed. In fact, we now think that these are some of the earliest manifestations of cave art that are known and that they date to about 31,000 to 28,000 years ago. Now, let's just get a sense of the time that we're talking about here. The most famous cave art that you probably all are familiar with, the paintings of Lascaux, not that far away, they're dated to about 15,000 years ago, okay? So there's about the same amount of time distance between us and the painters of Lascaux as there was between the painters of Lascaux and the people that probably made this image. And I have to tell you that standing there in the darkness, uh, don't touch the rock, but you can hold up your hand and there's the, the image of this prehistoric person that was there before you. And this is one of the, I had many extraordinary experiences in these decorated caves, but this is one that still makes me come out in goosebumps a bit, a bit. Who were these people? Where did they come from? What was running through their minds? What kind of lives did they lead? Um, the question of our origins of where humanity came from is a universal subject of fascination. Everybody's drawn to it. And uh, um, <clears throat> four years ago, the Leakey Foundation, which supports work on the fossil ancestors, the, the fossil traces of the people that made uh, uh, um, artworks like these and throughout, throughout prehistory, and it also, they also support research into living primates. It was their 50th anniversary coming up. They were founded in 1968. And they asked me to write a book about the 50 great discoveries in the hunt for the science of our human origins. And um, the, uh, th this was a, a daunting prospect, as, as it is to try to talk to you about it today. But... Um, as I was trying to figure out, well, how do, I, how do I introduce this subject to people? How do I get people into a sense of understanding it? And then a light bulb went off in my brain, and I, I noticed that the logo of the Leakey Foundation is this somehow very familiar procession of our ancestors, you know, starting out with a, you know, a, a less than advanced <laughs> ape and ending up with us at one side. Now, why is this so familiar? Well, this is... Um, this image, you see it everywhere in connection with our ancestors. And it all started in 1965 with this Time Life book called Early Man, which was very influential. It was a bestseller at the time. I remember I had my own copy. And it featured this uh, amazing pull-out section in the middle of it that, as you see, started this image of our ancestors in this great, long, straight line. In fact... You folded it out, and it became 15 ancestors, starting with uh, this guy back 3 million years ago, and coming up in a sort of inevitable march of progress through, well, the, the Neanderthals. We know they, they were extinct, so it wasn't quite, quite a straightforward story. In fact, the artist who did this, Rudolf Zallinger, had misgivings that this is a bit of an oversimplified view of <laughs> the inevitability of man's progress complained to the editor, apparently, but the editor said, no, they're going to love it. We're going to run this l like this. In fact, the biologist, Stephen Jay Gould, called this the canonical representation of evolution, the one picture that everybody immediately grasps and viscerally understands. And it, as I said, it implies that our evolution followed this kind of simple, inevitable course. Now, this, this idea went quite far back. Um, it was Darwin who suggested that uh, walking upright was the key human adaptation, okay? Because it, if we could walk upright, it would free our hands to make tools. And once you make tools, 
you're on this road to becoming very different and more advanced than, than any other primate. And uh, um, this idea really caught hold so that uh, um, around the time that the Leakey Foundation was set up, there was still the notion that what really set us apart from the other primates was a kind of package of advanced things. Our big brain, command of fire, uh, hunting, and um, this tool making, and uh, um, <coughs> in the academic world, one anthropologist, a Harvard anthropologist, Ernst Mayer, um, really championed this view. He thought, he, he said there was just one single line to all of humanity, it was a very powerful and influential academic, and that we'd only pass through three stages, three, an three ancestors were really all there was to the human story. So that's where we were. And um, uh, other, yes, there were other unfortunate uh, ancestors who didn't make it, like the Neanderthals. And they, once we'd spread out of Africa, once we'd left Africa sort of uh, probably around 60 to 40,000 years ago, they were literally brushed aside and, and quickly sent into extinction, okay? So it was like the triumph. Imagine us, the notion of our ancestors spreading out from Africa and pushing aside inferior creatures. Does this have a familiar ring from you know, the colonialist era, yeah, there's something to that. Um, the anthropologist Ian Tattersall called it, summoning him up, he said, this is a lovely quote, humanity has, like the hero of some ancient epic poem, struggled, struggled single-handedly from primitiveness to its present peak of perfection. He, he was trying to sum it up. And now, you know, um, now here we are in the present, you know, we've, we brought this pack, unique package of stuff that led, has led to this triumphal, triumphant human story. And um, most people think that since the, the, the farming was invented, that our biology and everything about us has been somewhat insulated from our culture. That we kind of stopped evolving because we got there and now we've got technology, we've got our buildings and everything and, we're, and we've got healthcare, etc., and human evolution, we think, basically we think that we are following the template that we got to by, you know, say 5,000 years ago, and we've kind of stayed the same. And I'm here to tell you tonight that science has, recent science is showing that every single thing that I've said in the last 10 minutes is completely wrong, okay? So there's, a, there's some, some debunking going on here. But meanwhile, let's just continue having some fun because here's the influence. I've just followed, <laughs> the, this is a homo e device, right? And this is one of my favorites, the, the Simpsons version of it. Monkeyus etalotus, there we go. Uh, Neanderthal, ending up with Homer sapien, you know, that's the. <laughs> Yeah, sure. But this is the most, this is really my favorite because what took you so long? Yeah, where are the women in all these scenes? I mean, it's like you can't have evolution without women, right? And yet they're completely absent from all this iconography. It's all about the male force, okay? We're stuck. All right. Okay. Thanks. Yes. I just want to illustrate the, the sort of the how the popular media de dealt with this. This is the first mega bestseller on a human evolution, dating to 1870, and um, y you can see th this is the, uh, this popular book was structured going from uh, primitive, brutish uh, ancestors all the way up to Fully, the fully evolved, heroic, romantic um, artist hunter of the Ice Age. And you see it's a very idealized notion, again, of this sort of trajectory of, of the unique and special humanity. 
And just after, that was from 1870. This is from about 1898. And the Paris salons between 1898 and, and uh, um, I'm sorry, between around 1888 and 1893, um, went through this fad of extremely realistic and kind of soft porn versions of uh, very, very white Anglo-Saxon ancestors, okay? Meanwhile, the Neanderthals were really being dumped upon at this time. This is the most fantastic of all the depictions of Neanderthals dating to 1906, based on a faulty anatomical reconstruction that, that appeared around that time and that led to the famous stereotype of the, of the caveman, of the ape man, the slouching guy. It was based on a complete misreading of this Neanderthal fossil. But this was in the Illustrated London News, and that's about as bad as the Neanderthal image got. Um, these are the famous murals that were done for the American Museum of Natural History by the great artist Charles Knight. But you see again, uh, and again, the, 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 the fully modern, anatomically modern cave artists are shown as these, you know, very athletic, well-developed white people. And here are the Neanderthals who are, you know, clearly they've got something left to be left to be desired. Now, I found this image this weekend. This is a relatively new image, but look how this idea has persisted. I mean, I think this, this guy kind of reminds me of Michael Douglas. <laughs> But you know, if you think about it, here is the, you know, the the, the pioneering crusading um, family, family <laughs> thank you, <laughs> taking uh, taking over the world. Okay, so where do we start on the real on the real science here? Um, Lewis Leakey was a very important figure uh, in correcting, beginning the long road to correcting these ideas. He was born in 1903 and grew up in Kenya. He is uh, the son of uh, missionary parents. He was bilingual and hung out with the, the local Kikuyu tribesmen. He's actually initiated into the indigenous K Kikuyu people. So he was a maverick. He was different from this. He spent all his childhood out in the wild, out in nature and, and hanging out with the Kikuyu. And he was, a, he was an oddball man. He was an, <laughs> a maverick. Um, never fit in quite properly at Cambridge where he went to study and he came up, when he became an archaeologist he came up with the idea that humanity's origins were to be sought in Africa which at the time was not uh, widely held because there had been very important discoveries uh, of fossil ancestors in Asia um, and Leakey was told by a supervisor at Cambridge, you know, there's nothing in Africa to worth, worth uh, looking at. Although Darwin himself had thought that humanity's origins were to be sought in Africa because of the anatomical resemblance of the great apes to our own, you know, to our own uh, skeletal features. Anyway, it's a long story that you have to read my book, but uh, he went w with his wife, Mary, to Olivier Gorge, and with a, 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 a lot, much is due to the National Geographic Society and their magazine in turning his discoveries into a truly a huge, huge popular sensation in 1959 and 1960. Um, th this illustrates that his, he was very much a hands-on person in trying to understand the life ways of, uh, of ancient people. And an enormously charismatic speaker, hugely successful at speaking to public audiences and raising funds. But his most important, from his point of view, certainly his most important find at Olduvai was in 1960. Uh, and it was just fragments. This is all reconstructed. This is the skull of Homo habilis. And he named it Homo habilis. Um, that means handyman. And there were crude... Sim very simple chipped cobblestones all over all by Gorge. They were the, the prim m very most earliest stages of stone tools. And so Lewis b was constantly was searching for the tool maker because he believed that that tool making was again our, our special source, our special adaptation that set us off. And th this was a b a b the most advanced and most homo-like of all the several different species that he found there. And so he dubbed this Homo habilis, 
And uh, Lewis believed, he, he followed this common outlook that it was our big brain, our ability to walk and make tools that made us special. And he believed that that special human line went back 20 million years. There was no way of dating this at the time that he was doing this work. But unlike other, other people at the time, he, he believed that we did our evolution in parallel with other human species. He did not buy into the solitary single tree idea because he said, surely humans evolved much like all other species. And we know that all other animals have you know, multiple relatives. It's, it's like a, a, spreading, a spreading branch, not a single tree of origins. So that was an important step. And um, the first really serious uh, crack in the image or in the received notion of all this was also started by Lewis when he um, got the idea, the very original idea, that doing long-term observations of living primates in the wild might throw light on the, the vanished ways of our ancestors. And he decided that uh, instead of academics uh, or highly qualified people, he would set very observant women who were really dedicated and had many skills that, you know, good, uh, just good all-round intelligent people <laughs> rather than, um, rather than scholarly types. And so Lewis was responsible for starting the careers. Th these were the trimates, the famous trimates, as they're called. Uh, on the left, Baruti Galdikas, who uh, took on orangutans at his behest. Jane Goodall, of course, in the middle, whom he was, uh, Lewis was entirely responsible for sending off, beginning her now world-famous work with chimpanzees at Go the Gombe Reserve in Tanzania. And this is Diane Fossey in, in uh, a strange photo of her uh, because she looks very different in other pictures. But anyway, she is, of course, famous from uh, the, the, her work with the gorillas in uh, the, what's now the DRC. She became famous through Gorillas in the Mist, the movie, you know, uh, incredible stories that all these three women started. But what was really important, of course, was these were the idea of long-term observations of primates, nobody did it. Everybody thought, it was all about hunting for individual specimens, right? That you would stuff and have in your collection. And, and, and any time you actually went into the wild to try to see chimpanzees and gorillas, they just take off, particularly chim chimpanzees. Jane spent her first two months tearing her hair out because she could not get anywhere near the chimps, okay? and this. It is a true pic I mean, it's just obviously posed for the Nat Geo photographer, but nevertheless, she was constantly scaling trees to see where are they. So anyway, her story is incredible. And the most important piece of it was that she was the first to observe a primate's using tools. In this case, it was her, her, a chimp that finally allowed her to get, start to get friendly a little bit. All the bananas she left out helped. And th this, uh, uh, David used a stick to poke into termite nests and lick and eat, eat the, the ants off it. Um, subsequent researchers have extended this picture of chimps as tool makers. And this is, in fact, a recent uh, leaky supported um, research in the, in the uh, Cote d'Ivoire in the far west of Africa, on the other side of Africa from where Jane was working. And here they actually crack open nuts with these stone cobbles. And they actually save cobbles that work well. I mean, this is really remarkable uh, behavior. And they also found that there were different uh, practices, literally different cultural ways of doing this between one set of chimps in one area and, and in another. In other words, the, the idea was invented, was passed on to some groups, but they developed their own styles. This is all fairly recent research. So, boom, out the window goes the notion that tool making was our, our, our big deal. Uh-uh, these guys do it, okay? 
the uh, now now we're going to get into the fossils a little bit, um, and the, uh, the the second major uh, uh, crack in the, the received picture is the notion of the big brain um, being what makes us special. This is uh, Don Johansson with probably the most famous fossil skeleton. If you've heard of one fossil, you might, you've probably heard of Lucy that uh, Don discovered in Ethiopia in 1974. And uh, it's now, uh, the reason why this was so special is it was very far back, it was three million years, uh, three million years old, and it's really the most complete skeleton of any ancestor that had been found to this point. We just didn't know the anatomy of the full anatomy. And it immediately confirmed that upright walking was fully, fully uh, operative back then, three million years ago. So Darwin was right. Upright walking was the fundamental invention, so to speak, uh, fundamental adaptation, I should say. Now we have over 400 specimens of Australopithecus, of, of Lucy's uh, species. We have 90% of their anatomy. We know these creatures really well by now. They lived for, their, their evolutionary span was about 800,000 years. That's three times longer than us Homo sa sapiens, right? So they were very successful. Um, they were only about three feet tall. Here's a wonderful reconstruction by the paleo artist John Gurchy, and we're going to see some more examples of it. And John Gurchy was trained, uh, was a, is a genius artist, but he's trained as an, an, as an anatomist, as a forensic anatomist, and these are highly accurate renditions of what Lucy's kind looked like. And here she is shutting the glass case at the Smithsonian, looking a little bit uh, queasy about what's happened to her. But um, look at how different she is in a way. She's got, got this stocky pot belly, but most of all, she's only three feet tall, folks. You know, that this is a small, vulnerable creature. Um, and Lucy's, Lucy's kind still has adaptations for climbing and clambering in the trees. Her shoulders are very well built. She has long, grasping fingers for the branches. So we know that they spent time in the trees. But the upright walking developed, we think, because the climate was changing. It was getting drier and warmer and was thinning out the African forests. So there was, um, chimps are terrible. At, uh, they can do short bursts of upright walking, but it's not a, a, pr a serious form of locomotion for them. And so this ability to walk Get, did that was that was again Darwin is right a, a crucial adaptation okay and the proof that they could do it came very dramatically in um, 1978 when Mary Leakey who's seen in a later photo here came across these famous f famous footprints at a place called Lytoli in Kenya which showed two adult uh, uh, hominid ancestors and a smaller juvenile, perhaps walking hand in hand, we're just not sure, across this volcanic ash that had just been laid down and it was a, a, a light dusting over the surface of the rock. And there was probably some rain immediately afterwards that, that there was a chemical reaction that turned into, into a kind of a concrete-like hard sub surface. So this is like exhibit A. Yes, these guys definitely walked. But now here's interesting. This is from December, and I didn't know about this till. Uh, it shows you how, how fast the field is changing. This is an announcement in December. Um, these are the regular footprints at Lytoli, and they just uncovered a new section of the same site, and there is the footprint of an upright walking, unknown ancestor. We don't know is a different species from Australopithecus walking in the same direction, and we have no idea what the rest of him looked like. But I have this lovely picture of our little, of our little Lucy family walking along, looking over there and saying, you know, a mystery creature walking by. That's probably an exaggeration. They probably weren't there at the same time. But 
this shows you what an exciting field it is, just constantly changing. Now, we're going to leap forward to 1.6 million years ago. We were at 3 million with Lucy. And you're gonna, you see a dramatic contrast here. This is the famous skeleton called Turkana Boy. And he was found um, not at all by Gorge, but by uh, a team led by the son of Louis Leakey, Richard Leakey, who made many uh, tremendous discoveries um, in an area well to the north of Old Dubai in, in, uh, in Kenya. And one day, uh, he, he had a, a crack team of um, African fossil hunters that he trained, lo local fossil uh, hunters. And one day, they spotted just a gleam of bone, a tiny gleam of bone, and they started digging around and they found th it was staggering to them because they, one of the first bones they found were these rib bones, which are so delicate, they're never preserved in fossils. So the minute they hold, hold a rib bone, they said, my God, we've got something incredible here. They found over 150 pieces. It's actually the most complete skeleton we have of any fossil ancestor. And this, is the uh, this, this ancestor is called Homo erectus. And he's very important because he is the first uh, representation, representative of the human family to, to be outside Africa and to uh, have occupied most of the uh, continental Europe and, and Asia but starting around about mm, just after two million years ago. This is the first exodus out of Africa, not of our kind, not of the fully modern humans. There was this earlier exodus of, um, I'm, I'm going to say, a much more primitive creature. <laughs> there we go. Value judgments? No. Um, this guy, let's say, represents, be, because he's so complete, this is 1984, this is found. So this becomes now the iconic image of uh, the humans that made it out of Africa first. And you're not looking at the pot-bellied, stocky, um, uh, 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 ancestor like Lucy, you're looking at someone with a basically completely modern anatomical body plan with the ability to walk and to run, uh, very tall, uh, very athletic, tall looking. Um, now here, but <laughs> his brain is 800 cc's, which is half that of our, of, of, of humans today. Uh, yeah, it's twice the capacity of a, of a chimp or an australopithecine. But nevertheless, did he have thought processes like us? We don't know. Did he have language? We have no idea. It's just uh, not a clue. Now, when he's first found, um, uh, he measures his, uh, sorry, <laughs> start again. His, uh, his skeleton measures about five feet, just over five feet. And to estimate age, you study the development of the teeth, okay? You can get an average uh, age estimate. And they came up startlingly with the notion that this guy was only 11 to 12 years old. And that meant that he still, being 11 to 12, he still had some growing to do. So they calculated and said, well, he must have ended up as an adult over six foot tall. So. The, uh, there were remnant australopithecines around at the time. So imagine this guy is towering over other, other relatives like Lucy, okay? Well, somebody checked with a different dental technique, more like counting tree rings, okay, inside the teeth. And they came up with the fact that he was eight years old and mostly full grown. And so they cut him down to size a bit, but they still... Uh, calculated that when he was adult, he would be like five foot four or something like this. Well, what's going on here? This is an eight-year-old that is nearly five foot tall. And what this means is there's a the different development rate, a much faster development rate than uh, humans today have. And the reason for our slower development rate is, of course, we have this long period of childhood, right? which is very, very important, of course, as we know, for um, 
all the things that you have to do to learn to become an adult, right? So there's a diff quite a different kind of scenario going on here. We're not anywhere near the kind of modern pat pattern yet, right? But, again, here's our stereotype. This really got in people's heads. You know, a six-foot trailblazer leaving Africa, going out, conquering Asia. You know, he fit the old picture, okay? Um, that is wrong. And I'm going to just quickly run through my, one of my favorites. If I can get, oh, sorry. One of my, uh, oh, yeah. Now, this is John Gertie's, sorry, this is John Gertie's image of that skeleton we've just seen. Um, and skin color is very varied in Africa. It always has been. But under an equatorial sun, more likely to have been black like that. So think about the stereotype, stereotypical images and think about this, which is a Turkana boy, probably. Now, one of the most, I'm just going to quickly run through um, one of the stories that I wrote that most haunts me, that, that really, um, really boggles the mind. Because uh, I told you that Turkana boy and Homo erectus, they were the first to leave Africa. That was the assumption, all right? In the 1980s, um, an archaeologist began. Uh, th th sorry, this is the site of Dimanisi, okay? This is a medieval ruin on this high cliff, very dramatic s location between two river valleys that converge together. And so the archaeologists, this was a, quite a prosperous uh, trade route meeting place in medieval times, a mo you know, a monastery. And um, This is in the Caucasus, I'm sorry, in Georgia, uh, uh, about 100 miles from the capital, Tbilisi. In 1983, they were digging in this ruin, this medieval ruin here, and they sank a shaft down, and they pulled up the tooth of an extinct rhino, which is not what you expect in a medieval excavation. Um, and it turned out that they, the whole uh, site had been built on a layer of volcanic ash that dated back to 1.8 million years ago. And in the course of several seasons, they pulled up five uh, skulls, human skulls, that were incredibly well-preserved. Whoops, here we go. Uh, remarkably well-preserved and totally, totally different. Each one was completely different from the, from the last, all right? Uh, some were very primitive and some were more advanced. And they think that uh, the, the, are, the people studying them think that these were all one species. Actually, there's a big debate. You know, are these separate species or is it one highly variable type of ancestor? These are the kind of questions that you have to, to wrestle with in this subject. Um, they averaged about five feet. They were pretty, and they were only very slightly built, only 100 pounds or so. They had tiny brains, one third of a modern, a modern brain. And they were occupying a landscape with saber-toothed tigers, hyenas, giant cheetahs, and European jaguars, there are serious predators around on this plateau. And in fact, we don't find these remains in some peaceful setting. These are the victims of those huge predators. They dragged these poor little hominids into their dens on this plateau, okay, and, and consumed them and gnawed on the bones. That's how we know. And so um, they, they, didn't have fire, okay? They got it out of Africa. There is no trace of them having, any, having fire. They had the crudest stone cobbles, not much more advanced than what people, the, those Homo habilis made in Olduvai Gorge. Um, they ate mammoth. Uh, they figured out that they were, you know, they did find s s occupation site, and they figured out that they ate mammoth, deer, and wolves. But, but they, they had to eat the flesh raw, okay? They were a 1,000 miles away from Africa. The weather was much more seasonal and challenging, and um, food would have been scarcer. So uh, to me, it's just kind of a haunting picture of these. These are the first people out of Africa, these tiny little, rather helpless, highly vulnerable ancestors. And one of them, 
this one had lost all his teeth. He was just one molar left to the back. The teeth were rotted completely down to the gun line. He was in tremendous dental pain, but he survived to relatively old age. That means he must have been cared for and looked after by the other hominids on the site. And this seems to be the earliest evidence of compassionate care. Um, so this is a real conundrum. You've got uh, an ancestor with a tiny brain that nevertheless exhibits this behavior that we think of as very human to this, to this day, of course. Um, how are we doing for time? Am I probably wildly overrunning. Uh, <laughs> there's much else to cover, but I'm going to summarize it by saying that the, 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 the third main crack in this picture, in the received notion, was of course the, the advent of DNA, um, which uh, has revealed the existence of a, a contemporaneous human species that um, uh, on a scale that we never dreamed of, including entire populations that we know only from their DNA, not from fossils at all. And the most remarkable uh, case of that, let me just jump to it because it is, and this is probably going to be the last thing I'll leave you with because I do want to leave time for questions. Um, what I was going to tell you about was, of course, the famous uh, sequencing of the Neanderthal genome. This is the first ancient uh, DNA to be recovered by the Swedish geneticist Svante Pabo. Um, a lovely reconstruction of Neanderthal uh, by John Gertrude. Think of that again in contrast to those brutish images of Neanderthals. And what the DNA of Neanderthals showed that uh, we didn't wipe them out. We, we had babies with them because the DNA of all humans outside Africa today contains a small but 2% on average of Neanderthal DNA. And it means there were, there were repeated episodes of interbreeding between modern anatomically modern humans spreading out of Africa and these other ancestors, the Neanderthals, who'd been living up in the north, up in Europe and Asia. Okay, so that's, that really surprised people. That was, that was uh, 2010 when that was published. In the same year, this site in Siberia yielded some human bones. This tiny bone, is the most sensational discovery in, in uh, ancient DNA because it turned out to be a completely unknown population. They now, they're, not, they're called the Denisovans or the Denisovans and they were related to the Neanderthals and we now have found there, by looking at the amount of Denisovan DNA in, mo in modern peoples in Asia, uh, all the way th down to Southeast Asia, these Denisovans, we didn't know about till 2010, occupied a huge expanse, and they even found them in uh, uh, the only, one of the only fossils that we now think is probably a Denisovan, is a huge jaw that was found in a cave on a thousand miles from this place. So this is an astounding new perspective. We were missing this huge piece of the human story that was just being found. And I was going to tell you then, uh, the, the final thought is that, um, so what was the landscape like for humanity, so let's say around 70,000 years ago? Well, we now know that there was us, okay, there were Homo sapiens living in uh, large parts of Europe. There were now, we know, at least three different Denisovan groups, okay? And the Neanderthals were there. Um, and there's evidence now that the, it gets complicated, the Denisovans were interbreeding, no, no, the, there's evidence that we interbred with Neanderthals and uh, Oh, I've got, I've, I'm sorry, I've got it wrong. It's 
too, too complicated. Okay, there's us. There's three Denisovan groups. They interbred with Neanderthals and with another ghost population in Asia that was found by an AI program fairly recently. So all I'm trying to say is that, that there's a parallel here to what's going on in cosmology because we don't know. There's this stuff called dark matter, okay, out there. We have no idea what it is, but it makes up an enormous percentage of the universe. And there's an analogy in a way with what's been happening in this science. There was this huge landscape of multiple species that we're just starting to, to, to fill in, just starting to get a handle on. And that's really the most important theme of my book is that we, we're, we're cutting, yes, we were very special, but um, why did we make it and all those other human relatives and cousins didn't? Uh, I think there was a lot of luck in it as well as a lot of, uh, you know, our, 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 our skills and our adaptations. Um, but it's a crowded landscape. We, we used to think we were alone on the stage, but now it's, it's crowded with a multitude of these other strange and tantalizing creatures. Thank you. Sorry, that, that was a lot. Of <laughs> a lot of stuff to take in, but I'd love to take your questions. I have a question. Sure. Um, <laughs> well, there's, there's, interestingly, one of the clues to Neanderthal extinction, because they did die out, the thing is, um, there's no evidence at all that we, we, <laughs> the royal we, that we deliberately wipe them out. It's pos it's unlikely, because increasingly there's shown to be overlap of thousands of years between the incoming modern humans coming out of Africa and the Neanderthals who were established in the Middle East and, and Europe and Asia. Um, so there was coexistence and there was um, these episodes of interbreeding, but there's, uh, th there's also evidence of inbreeding in uh, little assemblages of Neanderthals that have been found, individual family groups. Um, there's some evidence of cannibalism, whether that was ritual or whether they were really in, in hard times. But it's very clear, just from plotting the sites, that their Neanderthals were much sparser on the ground than, than human populations coming in. So it could have been just a very, this very gradual process of nobody even being aware that, that, that they're being outcompeted, you know, pushed into more marginal hunting areas. So it's that kind of inference that you have to make. Um, you can look at the, the, you can look at the DNA and calculate that there's some diversity issues there that can give you clues to populations too. But it's 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 indirect. Yeah. The lack of fossils of the needs of makes me think you were very delicious. <laughs> Uh, well, that's it. Uh, they did, they, it must have been a slightly desperate, desperate business. They got cobbles, right? Yeah. Shoo, go away, yeah. Mr. Mr. Sabretooth, you know. <laughs> uh, it, it, that story continues to just, to really uh, grab me, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I, um, again, that row of five. Yeah. 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 How could you? Oh, so you was going to say how yeah. could you have determined that one had been cared for by the other, but simply because Sim you had had no food for some time. 
because he survived. He was fairly elderly by the, by the, the standards of the day. Okay. <laughs> with, with no yeah, with with, and the point is that the 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 jaw they were actually rotted right down into the bone. You know, so it's not just a question of the teeth being missing from the skull, which is the case. He had very serious need to go to the dentist, let's put it that way, and they can tell that. You know. yeah. There are other quite early examples um, of compassionate care. One, one at the site in Europe that's much more evident, dating to around about 800,000 or so. Uh, um, very, very interesting case you know, of a diseased individual that was definitely being seriously looked after. Um, it's very interesting stuff. Do you have stuff that you're going to add Well, yes, I alluded to that at the end. And what that referred to um, was that they take uh, the DNA of, of modern populations today and look for sequences in the d DNA that are um, distinctive by comparison to the already identified neanderthal gene sequences. In other words, they can start to separate out these ancestral uh, distinctive stretches of DNA in the modern record. And they can set a machine learning program to just parse tons and tons of data looking for patterns. This is kind of like pattern spotting. Um, and quite how they identified this as a population, I'm not, I'm not um, that knowledgeable about genetics. All I know is that I thought this is a mind-boggling notion that you don't even have um, fossil hunters. Um, you don't even have people in a lab looking at this stuff that it, uh, a piece of computer hardware can identify a previously unknown ancestral group. It's, it, it's, it's incredible. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> When we were at peak hominid diversity, what kind of folks were neighbors? How different were they? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, peak hominid diversity. Oh, uh, back at that period. Well, you have to think of, I mean, I talk about the, the stage being crowded, but generally speaking, Populations are a fraction of what they were today, and you have these vast landscapes, okay? And um, now, hunter gatherers today are not isolated peoples. They've developed very sophisticated uh, mechanism, mechanisms of um, uh, traveling long distances to communicate with other groups to find marriage partners, to trade in specialized items. And this is definitely true, being completely proven in the case of the cave artists, people that did you know, the wond wondrous paintings at Lascaux and so on. We know that they wintered in the Pyrenees and uh, in the caves there and would move down in the summer to take advantage of probably seal hunting and salmon hunting down in, in the, the coastal plains. And Cave art is extraordinarily, uh, there are extraordinary connections lasting over tens of thousands of years in what was represented. Um, and so there's a real, it, it's, not like, it's not like these are unsophisticated people marooned in this Ice Age wilderness at all. You know, um, our ancestors, our fully modern ancestors, developed these networks of, of exchange and marriage and so on. Um, nevertheless, in terms of total populations, were they aware of 
of the uh, of the of these Neanderthal peoples up in the hills somewhere. Um, pro I don't know. It's a um, great subject for fiction writers, you know. Always has been. Clan of the cave bear. Right? Except most fiction writers trade on these stereotypes, you know, that that I was showing you earlier. So the reality is is different. Well, this is very, the, my essay on, on the Neanderthals, um, there's definitely, it, it, there's actually hard evidence for that. Um, uh, in, it, it shows up in the bones, you know, you get, you get developmental abnormalities that, that suggest, and as I said, taken with the relatively low sparse density of Neanderthal sites, that suggests, it, but this is just towards the end. Neanderthals were living in, in, Europe and Asia for 300 to 400,000 years, you know, they're more successful than, than our civilization has been. Well, how long have we been going, you know, with our modern cultures? You know, it's, 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 they were very well adapted to their way of life, very well adapted. <laughs> I love that idea. That's great. This is, this is great grandpa. <laughs> um, why this site is interesting, Dimonisi, is because there is this weird variety of, uh, w and it's, it's this classic debate in this subject that um, is written large in the big picture you try, <coughs> are we looking at one species that's very variable, there's a lot of you know, var anatomical variety in it, or are these indeed really separate populations that are very distinctive, have different behavior and, and all the rest of it. But here they are, these very diverse bunch all crowded together, and there's been a lot of debate uh, about whether this represents one um, Homo georgicus, that's, that's the official Latin name of it, Georgia man, or is it Homo, or is it a forerunner of Homo erectus? What, what has happened in the, in, a, in the study of um, Homo erectus in, in Africa is that Turkana boy, as I told you, is very, very fully uh, worked out um, skeleton, strapping great height. Um, turns out to be not the rule, that there's an enormous variety in Homo erectus around the same time as Turkana boy. Lots of different heights and sizes, and uh, it's fascinating. There, there have been these periods when there's just a lot of diversity, okay? And again, this is not, uh, not the way we're used to thinking about the past and our ancestors. There's tremendous variety. Yes, <laughs> they always ask the best questions. <laughs> what kind of language do you know about, how many different languages do you cover? I was thinking, was asking about Neanderthals, but uh, is there a way to study that? Strongly, yes, there is the, um, the voice box. Um, and there is one bone that floats there called the hyoid, the hyoid bone. It's kind of this V-shaped thing that I, I think is, very loosely, <laughs> shows you how good my anatomy is, kind of loosely attached in the voice box, but it allows for the flexibility in our, of the, our ability to produce, uh, you know, uh, highly varied speech. And Neanderthals have that bone. Um, so there have been many, uh, and uh, everybody, before that was found, that was found in the 19, late 70s or 80s. Before that, lots of people said, because Neanderthals didn't produce art on a very regular basis, although they did towards the end of their evolution, um, and there's increasing evidence that they did, that, that they were fully capable of symbolic um, uh, thinking and thought, they buried their dead, okay? Now, 
were they just getting them out of the way, uh, nasty refuse in the cave? No, because they're, they're laid in these pits fairly carefully. So burying the dead, you know, there's a, there's a complex thinking going on there. Um, towards the end of their last uh, few 10,000 years, they start more and more evidence for them, um, probably doing body painting um, and doing other kinds of symbolic activity. Um, but that difference in behavior, it's, it's, but it's nothing compared to the intensity of cave art and what we do. Now, why is that? Is it just cultural? Or were their brains somehow different, you know, that they didn't want to go and do art the whole time? Um, so that difference was commonly used to say, mm, language must have been the difference. And it's, it's possibly true. Maybe they had a less developed sense of language, so they couldn't talk about themselves in quite the same way. Um, but then they found the bone, and that's, you know, it's pretty hard art. You know, pr pretty strong evidence. Basically, I don't think they were very different to us. Really don't. You know, I think they've just had a really rotten press. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great.